<laughs> Thanks so much for coming on this blustery Friday. I'm Dylan Siegler, and I'm the Director of Partnerships and Engagement at the Institute of Politics. And along with a number of partners and stakeholders, we've developed the Shriver Program for Leadership and Public Service, and we're so glad that all of you are here. This is the third of four workshops. And along with my colleague, Jamie Price here, who is the Executive Director of the Sergeant Shriver Peace Institute. Um, we are offering a deep dive look at the creation of the Peace Corps and taking a look at that from all angles. And we're so glad to have Bill Josephson here with us. And Bill um, was the general counsel of the Peace Corps and also had a lot, 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 lot to do with it actually coming to fruition. So he speaks from direct experience and um, we love hearing his insights. So these are our two folks who will be helping us out with the third workshop. Let me just give you a little quick background on the whole academic year Shriver program. So this quarter we've had three or four workshops and then we have what's called the Shriver Undergraduate Fellowship, which we're offering. The application for that is due November 24th at 11.59 p.m. That fellowship is for any undergraduate. Um, we're, we're ideally looking for students who have a lot of experience in public service, who are excited to really commit themselves from January to June of 2015 to this program to kind of like make it one of their big things that they're doing here on campus. We're looking for students who are interested in problem solving, who are creative, who are innovative, who um, want to take approaches like Sergeant Shriver did to creating the Peace Corps two urban problems here in the city of Chicago. Um, the application is up on Chicago Career Connection and it's pretty elaborate. We've kind of filled in everything that we're looking for. We're looking for a resume, a cover letter, an essay. And in a dream world, you have attended all of the workshops or will attend, or if you had to miss a session, they're all up online. And we've tried to really communicate how you can watch the videos from the workshop. So you don't have to feel like, you know, you missed a whole chunk of, um, this case study. Um, we, in a dream world, are giving preference to students who will be returning next year, but we are looking for the leadership of, yeah, you can just grab a seat right there. Oh, that's perfect, Jade. Um, we're looking for students who, you know, fourth years are welcome to apply. First years are welcome to apply, okay, because we're looking for all kinds of experience. And fourth years, even though you wouldn't be returning next year to mentor the next class of Shriver Fellows, um, you have a lot of leadership skills that, that you could offer. Finally, um, for the 12 or 15 students selected as Shriver Undergraduate Fellows, there's a guaranteed internship. So what does that mean? That means that we will have a $4,000 stipend reserved for you for summer 2015. Um, as a group, January to June, you'll be looking at an urban challenge, for example, something like developing the Chicago Peace Corps, which might be a program in violent neighborhoods to bring sustainable peace. And this would be something that you guys would develop on your own. And if through that you develop opportunities for summer internships, that might be an internship you'd work on summer 2015. Or you might say the National, the Shriver National Center for Poverty Law, um, Graceland, right up here is good, if you want. Um, so the, the National Poverty Law Center, which is here in Chicago, might have wonderful internship opportunities, and if that's where you want to take your stipend, you're welcome to do that. So there's a lot of freedom. I've heard questions like, what do I, you know, how's that going to work? And we'll work with you to make sure that what you're doing in the summer is relevant and is also something where you can learn new skills and bring a lot to it. Um, so with that said, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues, but I'll be here after the session. I'll be sitting right over there. If you have questions about how any of these pieces work, you can feel free to let me know or always email me too. So Jamie, you're okay. on. Okay. Well, thank you and uh, welcome to the third session. Um, this one, first time we focused on Sarge's method, last time we focused on the impl implementation, the formulation of the Peace Corps. The primary focus this time is going to be on the politics and the political battles that were fought to establish it. There'll be no PowerPoint this time around. The, we'll basically be um, going through the timeline that you have in, in front of you here. And our primary text is this man who um, 
will, who, ha, who lived it all, um, directed a lot of it, and so we'll be engaged in kind of a, an interview format with, with him. I'll lead that, but we'll also be taking questions from you. So, um, but I also know that Bill wants to make, before we enter into that, Bill wants to um, make a couple of, couple of comments to gather up what we've been doing so far so we can lead it into this, this next, um, next bit. And oh, before I go, I just want to point your attention to this thing that's also in front of you. Tim Shriver, Sergeant Shriver's son, my boss, um, is coming on Monday. I wish I could come back for that. He's, uh, he's a wonderful speaker, a terrific guy, has written a brilliant book, and you, if you can come back, um, you, you won't be sorry. Bill. So, thank you everybody for coming. It's really, it continues to be a pleasure for me to come back to Chicago and to see so many of you here, an extraordinary turnout that is very, very gratifying. And I wanted to take a moment or two and address some of the themes that Jamie has been developing, particularly the theme of service and the theme of compassion that are so central to uh, Sarge's um, public policies. And I'd like to uh, hark you back, if you will, to the two papers that were in your documents for the last session. The, the um, Milliken paper, which as you know from what I distributed, was specifically commissioned by JFK. But the Milliken paper has always struck me, perhaps it struck you this way too, as devoid of both service and of compassion. You're saying yes. Tell me why you agree with me. Why it's devoid of service and compassion? <coughs> well, I think sometimes it might be difficult to um, be able to successfully portray service and compassion in these kinds of documents, and maybe that was part of the reason why it didn't come. I mean, we've been talking about it, we've been so explicit, and we've been having a lot of PowerPoints say, you know, this is what it is, this is what goes into it, service and compassion, and what does that mean? And with that in mind, it's, I mean, I guess maybe I was different from other people in understanding it this way, but with that in mind, it was kind of missing that explicit, you know, uh, that explicit, like, understanding and that explicit, like, explanation of why it's important and what that, what those two things mean. Well, I think that that's exactly right. Exactly right. Do you, do you think that the Hayes paper is different? I mean, I think the Hayes paper is different. But yeah, does anybody think that the Hayes paper is, is qualitatively different from the Milliken paper? Well, at least let me say why I think it is. First of all, I think the Hayes paper is, is short. And, and it's important if you're trying to persuade somebody to take in a new initiative, it's important to be short. And the Hayes paper, I think, bespeaks humanity. It's very humane. And it really does talk about service in a way that the Milliken paper only pays, I think, excuse the expression, lip service. The one problem with the Hayes paper politically, does anybody know what the one problem with the Hayes paper politically, thinking back to the context in which it was written in September of 1960? Well, what do you think the chances would have been in September of 1960, <coughs> 61, of establishing the Peace Corps as part of the United Nations? You're smiling. Pretty small. <laughs> Why pretty small? Um, well, the UN is a huge monster of an organization in and of itself. Um, and the Peace Corps was like a new, very new, very unsure, very untested program that also aimed to do like a really different type of diplomacy kind of than I think they would have been comfortable with. 
Why do you think Sam believed in that? Everything you say I think is true, but nevertheless that's what he argued for. Why do you think so? Why do you think he argued for that? I think it comes back to compassion, and I think the youth aspect of the Peace Corps is actually really interesting, because instead of having these um, diplomats who are employed to, you know, smooth things over with foreign, foreign nationals and everything, um, you have these, like, young people who really want to make things right, which maybe is a different thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all true, I think, but also politically impossible couldn't have been done. For example, we had a little provision in the Peace Corps Act that authorized the assignment of volunteers to the United Nations and international agencies. Tiny little provision, just, you know, little extra piece of authority. And when we got to the Senate floor, uh, Senator Humphrey, who later, you know, became Vice President, Senator Humphrey was the manager of the bill on behalf of the uh, administration. And the Republican person who was signed to cover the Peace Corps bill was a senator from Iowa named Burke Hickenlooper, very smart. Burke was extremely smart, but he always looked a little bit like he had just chewed an enormously dill pickle. <laughs> but he wanted to take that provision out. And I said, you know, Humphrey and Hickenlooper and I are sitting here together negotiating, and I said, well, you know, Senator, it's the administration's position, and it should stay in. UN is a good thing. There are a lot of international programs. This would enhance the uh, allure of the Peace Corps as a service opportunity. And I learned a great lesson from Senator Humphrey, uh, which seems to have been forgotten by too many uh, politicians in the Congress these days. Hubert said to me, Bill, you have to understand that I'm the leader here, but I'm also the leader of the whole Senate. And Senator Hickenlooper and I have lots of things to deal with. We are going to compromise. And the compromise essentially was that we adopted a numerical limit to the number of volunteers that could be assigned to UN programs. The other point I want to make going back is it struck me uh, that using Jamie's framework of service and compassion, although, you know, obviously Warren Wiggins and I were completely unaware of this conceptual framework, but the towering task with its emphasis on work, ordinary work, and work with the people with whom you were working. Not as too much of the foreign aid program did and does, not telling them how it should be done, but doing whatever they do with them. And it struck me, as I said, although that we didn't know it at the time, that this exhibited both service and compassion. And perhaps that's why, you know, perhaps, that's why at this amazing meeting in the Mayflower Hotel that was attended by incoming Secretary of the Treasury Dillon, uh, that's why I think, Jamie, the meeting had to have taken place. Uh, earlier in January than you think, because he wasn't Secretary of the Treasury yet. He had been nominated, but not. And Ted Sorensen, who was uh, Kennedy's special counsel. And in front of everybody around this table was a copy of the Towering Task. And Sarge simply said, I want you to read it, turn the pages, because this is the Peace Corps that I imagine we're going to do. Not the Millican Peace Corps, not the Hayes Peace Corps, not the Albertson Berkey University of Colorado Peace Corps. This is the Peace Corps. Thank you. Any uh, 
Any questions to this point? Great, thank you, Bill. Well, as we talked about last time, um, and I see, uh, well, there are, there, I think a couple of typos on your, you can see that we need a, we need a February where March is, um, and maybe that's, maybe that's to Bill's point that, um, and then the, uh, the report to the president is on the 20, 22nd. Um, but the, t the, the task force did its work. The bill, I mean, the, the report goes to the president based on the towering task and the other kind of policy initiatives that we, that we talked about, which would kind of inculcate, as we, as we began to touch on last time, a kind of policies of compassion and service in practical ways that would happen. And then we, um, and then JFK has an executive order presented to him. Did you write that? I did write that, and you have to understand that in the process of creating something, there are many strands. We've been focusing so far on the programmatic strand, which of course is always the most important. Always the most important. You don't get the program right, forget it. But on the other hand, the program needs a container. And so, as the only lawyer working in the group, it fell to me to figure out what the container should be. And I decided that the president had authority under the Mutual Security Act by executive order to create a wholly new agency. And since Warren and Sarge and I firmly believe that the Peace Corps needed its own container. I set out to draft that executive order, which you can see is in your papers. It's very short. But the process was difficult. First of all, I had to deal with my legal counterparts in ICA and the Foreign Aid Program in the State Department. So there was a long negotiation with fellow lawyers about what the executive order should say and did we agree that the president had the authority to do this. And once, once the executive order emerged from the lawyers, then it had to go to what is now called the Office of Management and Budget, but was then simply called the Budget Division, the Budget Bureau. And there was a wonderful man in the Budget Bureau named Fred Levy who had actually supervised the drafting of every executive order since George Washington. He had forgotten more about executive orders than any of us would ever remember. And Fred and I sat down and he looked at my executive order and he simplified it tremendously. And then of course one had to deal with the president's counsel with Ted and Ted approved the order. So when the report to the president went to the president. The executive order was ready for the president to sign. Thank you. And then the, um, and w just so you know, when, when we or when Bill or I refer to a document, they are all in the Dropbox. Is that, is that right? So you. And, the, and we sent them out to everyone who had registered. I think we sent them out Wednesday evening. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But, and then we send them out, we follow up and say, here's where you can find it. Right. So all the documents we referred to, you, you, have, you have either read or have access, have access to. Um, the executive order gets signed. The president goes the same day, gives a special message to Congress, um, which we talked about last time. But almost before the ink is dry in his signature, administrative battles um, s begin. Uh, there's the issue of is Sarge going to be the director or not? He's only been he's only been in charge uh, he's only been charged to be the task force to this point, and um, as you will s as you will see from the from, from the letters you have in the next couple of days, he um, he offered to resign. What was going on with that, Bill? Well, I don't actually know because I, my recollection is that there was never any question in my mind that Sarge would be directed. And one of the documents you have, actually, 
is a memorandum that I wrote to a man named Richard Goodwin, who was Ted Sorensen's assistant. Uh, and I had identified a vacant advice and consent appointment authority that uh, was in an obscure reorganization plan that dated from the 50s. And so this memorandum to uh, Dick uh, said, you know, the president wants to appoint Sarge. It should be an advice and consent appointment. That's important for Sarge's status. And status, whether you like it or not, status in a bureaucracy, unfortunately, is always an issue. So if you're, you know, dealing with Mr. Labuise, who is going to have a presidential appointment for the head of aid, and, and with the Secretary of State and the Under Secretary of State, and so forth and so on, it'd be good to be in the same grouping. And I didn't know this until uh, I saw these documents that we got out of the Kennedy Library, but I didn't know that Sarge had written what I regard as an unusual letter, handwritten letter from him to the president. Um, not the usual self-effacing Shriver, but a Shriver who clearly understood that he needed a certain status, but was a little bit reluctant, blatantly to ask for it. And so, as Jamie says, he suggests that there are many people who could be better directors of the Peace Corps than he. I have, uh, don't know whether he was really serious about that. I don't know what you think, Jamie. But he writes, he obviously includes with his mem handwritten memo to the president, my memo to Goodwin. Because you'll see at the bottom of my memo to Goodwin, there's a subscript, JFK, I agree with this, Sarge. And so it was. But I mean, clearly, the, I think he would have been um, willing to step down if JFK hadn't acceded to that. Um, I don't think he. I don't think he said that. Uh, I don't think he said that lightly. But it obviously Dylan. signals. How would the Peace Corps? have turned out had Sarge not been appointed as director? Well, that depends on whether you have any notions about who might have taken it over. Kind of part of the question, right? I never thought about it. <laughs> never occurred to me. It, I, it, wouldn't, it would have become, as you'll see as we go forward, I think it would have become, whoever was running it, it would have become part of um, USAID. Yeah, probably, Jamie is probably right. It probably, well, we're now getting a little ahead of our story. I think we're about to answer your question. Okay? Because the next thing that happens, and, and Jamie and I have pinpointed it down to Friday, March 17. One of the things that I'm doing, if only to keep my eye on the enemy, was I'm also sitting on the task force in the State Department that is drafting the new foreign aid legislation. Yes? Can you talk more about like, who the enemy is? Say that again so that everybody can hear you. Can you talk more about who the enemy is? Like what are the opposing forces that are going against what's on That's what I'm about to tell you. Okay? <laughs> the draft of what you have in your documents of President Kennedy's special message on foreign aid said explicitly that the Peace Corps would be lumped into the new aid agency. And you may recall that Warren Wiggins and I started out talking about the importance of completely revamping the foreign aid agency. That's how we ultimately got to write the towering test. There was no need, no question, but that, that needed to be completely rethought. And it is very extensively rethought in the president's message. A great, a lot of detail about what should be and what should not be in the new foreign aid program, and uh, also a lot of uh, detail about what the program should try to accomplish, how it should be different from mutual security, how it should focus on development in 
development issues. But there was this sentence. So I took the document, the draft message to Warren Wiggins, and then we both walked in to see Sarge's assistant. Where is Sarge? Well, he's in Boston. So Warren and I flew up to Boston. And we met Sarge at the Ritz-Carlton where he was staying, and we showed him the document. This is by now Saturday. And back in those days, there were things, there were no things called business centers. There were things called public stenographers. We went down to the basement of the Ritz-Carlton, hired the public stenographer, and wrote a memorandum to the president. And I believe, although I can't, tell you for sure, that you'll see in the documents attached to Sarge's letters to Henry Labois, the incoming head of AID, and uh, to Ralph Dungan, who was the White House staffer assigned to work on the foreign aid program issues, you'll see that there are three memoranda attached to that that argue for the independence of the Peace Corps. I'm sure that one of them is the Ritz-Carlton Memorandum, but I can't tell you which one. But Bill, this seemed to have, this generated obviously a major threat, as we talked about it last time, in you and in Bill Wiggins, and obviously in Sarge, that um, what was at stake for the Peace Corps in its not being independent? We thought that if the Peace Corps were simply another agency buried in the Foreign Aid Program, it would be much less attractive to people who wanted to volunteer. And we also thought that countries chafing, as many of them were, under the excesses of mutual security would be far less interested in a Peace Corps that seemed to be part of the foreign aid program. So we were very worried about this uh, sentence because we thought it jeopardized the ability of the Peace Corps to capitalize on these two themes that Jamie and I have been talking about, the theme of service and the theme of compassion. We did not want to be buried overseas in the foreign aid program with PX privileges and, and, and living apart and working apart and telling people what to do as opposed to working with them the whole mission of the Peace Corps that you had devised would be compromised. We felt that. Yeah. So I remember that I took this memorandum back to Washington and I remember walking uh, across the park to the White House and giving it to Dick. And we waited. Dick Goodwin. Dick Goodwin. And we waited to see what would happen. And what happened, you have to understand the nature of the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy rarely deals with things cleanly. So, here's the offending sentence. The Peace Corps, <coughs> I propose that our separate and often confusing aid programs be integrated into a single administration embracing the present Washington and field operations of ICA, the Development Loan Program, Food for Peace, the Local Currency Lending Activities, the Export-Import Bank, the Peace Corps. And this is what was added to that phrase. The Peace Corps recognizing its distinctive contribution beyond the area of economic development. And here's a paragraph that did not exist in the exist in the prior draft. Programs such as the Peace Corps and Food for Peace, far from being submerged, will be used more effectively and their distinctive identity and appeal preserved. And food for peace will continue to be based 
on availability is determined by the Department of Agriculture. Now, one of the interesting aspects of this is that the head of Food for Peace, somebody that you later uh, became famous, George McGovern, was the incoming head of Food for Peace, who left shortly to run for the Senate from the home state of South Dakota. And as you know, um, when Gene McCarthy vanished uh, to have his affair with Shana Alexander at the <coughs> Democratic National Convention in 1968, and no one was there to pick up the Kennedy delegates, George McGovern as he put it, picked up the fallen standard. And that, of course, laid the predicate for his run for president with Sarge in 1972. So here we are, Jamie. We have all of this waffle. And what happens next? Well, it looks like Sarge is reading the positive side of the, the waffle. The president then, as we say, on the you know, a few days later, appoints Henry Labouisse to head the reorganization task force. Labouisse was appointed by the president to run ICA, the, um, the International Cooperation <coughs> Agency, to reorganize the task force. And so Sarge writes him a, a, a letter attaching your um, Boston memo. And he says, toward the end of it, I hope you and I can settle this thing between us without engaging all the troops in a Cecil B. DeMille encounter of lawyers, economists, and other experts. Perhaps this is the wrong way to conduct governmental operations, but I certainly hope it will be successful in ridding you of a minor headache and relieving me of a major one. What do you think? If you were Henry LaBouise, how would you react to that? Well, I think your reaction is correct. There's no evidence that I've ever seen that he ever did. No. What does that mean? Sarge is, Sarge is saying that he doesn't want to have a, a power battle over this. That he would rather have the uh, have Labouise acknowledge the arguments that Bill had made about this not being a government to government program, but a people to people program. About this, um, how, how did that how did that argument ever when you made it to Dungan or to Labouise or to the Kennedy staffers? What did they how did they reply? Well, you're getting a little bit ahead of the story, I think, because the next signal event, you know, is the Bay of Pigs and the disaster. I mean, this throws a monkey wrench into everything that was going on. You know, JFK had inherited this Alan Dulles CIA plan to try to overthrow Castro. And I guess in retrospect, he would say, he did say, that he just simply wasn't experienced enough to trust his instincts, to derail it at that point. And he believed the experts who said that the invasion would be greeted by an uprising in Cuba. Of course, none of that ever happened. So very early in the Kennedy administration, he suffers a foreign and domestic policy disaster. And then, you know, because it was very important to find out if countries really wanted Peace Corps volunteers, Sarge leaves on his round the world trip. And you've got documents in your papers that show where he visited, who he met, pictures, and so forth and so on. This was crucial because we needed to know whether or not countries would ask for Peace Corps volunteers. And this brought out uh, what I think had always been true of Shriver, uh, the salesman in him. That's essentially what he did at the Merchandise Mart when 
Joseph P. Kennedy bought the Merchandise Mart in 1946, it was empty. And now, as you know, if you've ever been downtown and, and wandered through it, it's a thriving showcase for American commerce. And Sarge was the salesman. He's the person who sold all of that. And he sold the Peace Corps. But then, <coughs> there was a meeting in the White House which Jamie dates on May 26th. April 26th. April 26th. And I, I got my date from, oh, yeah. Um, See? Any of the visits been successful? <coughs> no, they were all successful. They were all successful. Um, they were all, um, they were all, just like the Peace Corps, he didn't just drop in and say, hey, I'm here. Um, they were all invited. They all knew what we were gonna, he was going to talk about, and the tour involved him talking with the heads of heads of state and going out into the um, into the communities where Peace Corps volunteers would would work. Um, they were all they were all successful. As a matter of fact, word got around so much that by the time he got back, there were other requests waiting with the president. <laughs> so, and this I should mention led to another strain because of, of work that one had to do. Uh, we needed to have executive agreements with all these countries so that Peace Corps volunteers could come in and Peace Corps staff could come in. But they were very different from the AID agreements because, as I said before, no relief from customs, no relief from host country civil and criminal jurisdiction. You know, basically we just needed to have very simple agreement that said Peace Corps volunteers would come and Peace Corps volunteers would be treated like everybody else. Yeah. Yes. Um, were there any special cases for countries where um, U.S. relations with that country might have not been so great? But yes, India was a great concern. Did you, did you hear the question? Yeah. Were there any Were there any countries where relationships were not so great? India was a great concern because it was then the country that was the head of the unaligned countries, and of course Nehru was an extraordinarily uh, willful and difficult person. So it was amazing to us that Nehru bought into the Peace Corps. He could easily have seen it as the Russians, with whom India had a very close relationship <coughs> with respect to military assistance at that time, he could have seen it as the Russians portrayed it as a group of American spies, but he did not. And his support of the Peace Corps <laughs> was extraordinarily influential throughout the world. But in the middle of this, in the middle of Sarge's tour, there's a meeting in the White House that Ralph Dungan calls one of President Kennedy's special assistants. And I'm there, and Henry Labois is there, David Bell, the head of the budget division, who had been assigned by McGeorge Bundy, uh, President Kennedy's special assistant for foreign affairs, uh, to oversee the work of the Labouise task force. And Bell was an extremely uh, intelligent, cool, far-seeing, wonderful person. Um, but. Labuis was absolutely adamant. He was going to keep the Peace Corps no matter what. And no one except myself was prepared to take him on on that. And uh, Ralph purported on behalf of the President, specifically on behalf of the President, to settle the issue that the Peace Corps would be part of AID. And uh, we cabled Sarge, the summary of that meeting. I have a, just a question. What were, um, sort of to go back to my other question, you know, you guys were so clear that Peace Corps mission was going to be completely undercut if it were part of, the, this was a major, this was a major battle. Obviously the others, the, the enemies, if you, if you will, the, the people who, um, in, um, 
the president's advisors and the folks in the or organizing foreign aid were feeling that no, this was the wrong decision. What was their concern? Well, remember that foreign aid was a big deal, a big and important, expensive program. The Peace Corps was a little untried, untested program. So the Peace Corps, in the context of the foreign aid program, didn't have a lot of weight. The other factor, which I think is also something you need to get into your head when you're dealing with your bureaucracy. Bureaucrats like neatness. They like consolidation. They don't like messiness. And this was very much, if you will, a, uh, a McKinsey and Company kind of exercise. Let's take all of these various strands that the president del delineates in his special message, and let's put them together in a coherent, not an incoherent, whole. So, so the issue wasn't that they thought the Peace Corps was wrong-headed, or that they, they thought it, it might work, but that it needed to be inside their box. They couldn't see it outside the box. Okay. So, so, yes, please. Um, was the buy-in from countries like India and the rest of the countries on the risk contingent on the independence of the Peace Corps? That's an interesting question. In, the, in those documents, yes, they were, um, <coughs> that's certainly what Sarge was selling. And um, the, in the notes that come back, it's, it's, very, it's very clear that people want it to be independent, they want it to be something else, they don't really trust. Um, those, the other kinds of aid efforts from the from Russia or Remember, from the Remember, aid is a Cold War program. Was and it stayed as such. Yeah. Please speak so that everyone can hear you, even way down in that corner. <laughs> um, during our first workshop, um, we learned that um, the Peace Corps was an example where um, for me to have like spiritual value within the government, but um, today we see that um, the Peace Corps program itself was trying to pull away from any like political or government, um, I, I don't really want to say influence, but ties I suppose, like what was the extent to how much, how much was the government really like tied to the Peace Corps? Well, we needed money. <laughs> was that, so? We needed appropriations, okay? And we needed to have an authorizing act because you can't have appropriations without an authorizing statute. So whether was the Peace Corps would wind up in the Foreign Aid Act or the Peace Corps Act, as it finally did, we needed legislation. And we needed legislation before we could get an appropriation. You know, the, the Congress is divided between the authorizing committees, the substantive committees that work on program, and the appropriations committees that actually decide how much will be spent. And the appropriations committees have subcommittees, and the subcommittees divide up the government. And for example, while we were able, as you will see shortly, to have the Peace Corps Act enacted independently of foreign aid, we were never able to get the appropriation away from the Foreign Aid Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee. Try as we might, and we did try, we were never able to do that. Otto Passman, a very, very tough-minded, difficult congressman from Louisiana, who later went to jail, uh, <laughs> was absolutely obdurate. Yes, you have a question. I do. Do you think, looking back, that... Louder. Do you think, looking back, that there's another statute that you could have used as the authority that would have moved you further away from being connected to foreign no. aid? No, no. And you had a question. My question was that, do you think the fact that the Peace Corps would be independent, yet be helpful in regards to Sardin's vision, was a cause for concern among the committees, the different levels of committees, because there was a sense of independence and there's like almost almost no political ties 
that drove them crazy that started the political battle? That's a very shrewd question. Uh, we're going to get ahead of the story a little bit, okay? No, that's all right. That's fine. In, in the House Foreign Affairs Committee, in the authorizing committee in the House, the Peace Corps always enjoyed tremendous bipartisan support. Republicans, Democrats, no question about it. Peace Corps Act passed the House by something like 430, mm -hmm. something like that. Amazing number. The story in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee was quite different because the chairman, J. William, William Fulbright, hated the Peace Corps. Yes? Why did he hate the Peace Corps? You're, no, you, you're shaking your head. I think it's an interesting tidbit of information. You've got to say that so that you can be heard out there. I found that piece of information about Fulbright interesting, so I nodded. <laughs> <laughs> and we will come back to Fulbright. Yeah. We'll come back. We'll come back to that, okay? But you have to understand that in the Senate, it was not a piece of cake. You got a powerful chairman, long-serving chairman, one of the Southern group, you know, with Richard Russell and Alan Ellender and John Stennis, just to reel off names of the people who really exercised power in the Democratic Senate in those days. A very different group of Democrats than what you're used to now where I think now we have not a single senator or representative from the Deep South and the Democratic. I think that's, I think that's true. Um, just one thing. I would just say to your, to your comment that, um, yes, I think, it's, I think it's fair to assume that the, uh, that the notion that they wanted to have an independent political operation that was so popular that was reaching out across, you know, ac across the globe, whereas another apparatus was saying, wait a minute, no, that's our job. So there was, there, there, I'm sure there was a power dynamic going on. We don't have it, um, but I mean, it's reasonable, it's reasonable to say, particularly the intransigence. It isn't, you know, it isn't like an argument about, well, what, what structure should this be in? There's just a lot of energy around this question, and so it's deep-rooted. Was one reason um, Love Luis wanted the Peace Corps under the Foreign Aid umbrella was that um, the Foreign Aid Appropriations Act would be much more of a sure deal than um, getting appropriations for the Peace Corps independently? He thought that the Peace Corps would enhance his own program, which of course was not popular. Mm -hmm. And he recognized the Peace Corps would be popular. But, you know, uh, that's a really a tail wagging the dog argument. But you were trying to give him a benevolent take on it, right. to try to protect the Peace Corps, um, yeah, like the, protect its funding, getting, getting funding because foreign aid would be funded. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, in your document... Dylan had a question. I know that, but <laughs> I'm looking at the clock. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, uh, in your documents, you have documents about the National Advisory Council. Now, people might think National Advisory Councils were worthless. They're not worthless. They give you a lot of political support. They give you a lot of political cover. And you'll see that Sarge recommended three people to head the National Advisory Council. Justice William O. Douglas, well, that was out of the question, because that's not what Supreme Court justices do. David William Thaw is a figure from the Tennessee Valley Authority, the Roosevelt New Deal figure, created the Tennessee Valley Authority then had a private company in New York that was building controversial dams all over the world. So that was out of the question. And the third person on the list you'll see is the vice president. And that turned out to be crucial because Sarge telegraphs Bill Moyers, the vice president's assistant, to get the vice president involved in this issue. And the vice president asked for a meeting with the president. And so we all convene again in Ralph Dungan's office. Bob Weiss, David Bell, 
myself, and Lyndon Johnson. And we wait. And we all expected to meet with the president, but we wound up not meeting with the president. You have a wonderful letter from Bill Moyers in your papers uh, describing Johnson's behavior and the job, why Johnson felt so strongly about, about Peace Corps independence that comes out of his own experience in hard scrabble Texas during the Depression. And I swear, Johnson spent the whole time as we were waiting to see Kennedy hectoring Lobbies. I thought at one point Johnson, who was a really big man, six feet four, was going to pick Harry up by his ears and lift him up. <laughs> Later that night, Johnson saw Kennedy and persuaded him to be so with him. And I no longer remember how we got that news. But I picked up the phone, called Ralph Dungan, and I said to Ralph something like, I'd like to come over, smoke the pipe of peace. Uh, we need to be working together. Um, we can help you, you can help us. Ralph told me to drop dead. Said you wanted to be on your own, you're on your own. Don't come running to us for help when you need help. And remember, Sarge is out of the country this whole time. All of this is happening. Um, and I, also, we didn't we didn't say lots of other things are happening too. I mean, it's an ex we're, this is a very detailed and 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 busy and busy time for 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 Bill, but recruiting is going on, training is going on. All of those all of those people listed there under under March when the agency when Sarge pulled together the agency and launched all those um, all those host country negotiations that started yeah. in the wake of Sarge's trip were going on yeah I mean now he has countries require I mean you know requesting Peace Corps volunteers so he's got to have Peace Corps volunteers it means you got to recruit him it means you got to you, you, you got to send program people to the various countries to figure out Set what them the up. program all, is. all of this is going on I mean the number of people that I talked to when I've talked about Sarge Yes, um, have said he was the finest public administrator they've ever run into. That, I mean, not only did he have vision, but he was able to do these things. Bill once told me, um, in reference to his, one of his, one of the thinkers that he, uh, that he praises, Isaiah Berlin, that uh, Sarge was the only person that you ever met, if I have this right, who was both a fox and a hedgehog. Right. Now I am too, incidentally. <laughs> <laughs> Takes one to know one. <laughs> there was a he. Um, Berlin wrote a book. It's called uh, "The Fox and the Hedgehog." No, 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 no. no. That's, that's not right. <coughs> he wrote an essay. Sorry. He wrote an essay on Tolstoy's theory of history. Well, I called it a book and because he, it had two covers. And he headed it with a. A, 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 a quote from a fragment of a Greek philosopher about whom we know absolutely nothing, uh, which simply said, <clears throat> the fox knows many things, the hedgehog knows one big thing. That's right. And he went on to call Tolstoy a hedgehog and to explain why. But. Yes. I'm, Both. I was just wondering, the funding that was supporting the setup, was that kind of guaranteed as different from the oh. USAID, or like where was that coming from? That's a very good <laughs> question. Bill arranged that, and yes, it's, it's different. Okay, so now it's been decided. You have a question. Yes, you, you were simultaneous. Okay. Um, I just Louder. Wanted, I wanted to ask about how he was able to be both you you have an understanding of the big picture as you kids would call it and you also know as Le Corbier, Le Corbier once said that the devil is in the details 
so many people, you know, have the big picture and many people have the details, but very few people have the big picture and understand the importance of the details. And yes. Was it possible to fund the Peace Corps through private philanthropy? And if the Peace Corps were to be set up again today, would the appropriation uh, be the best job? I don't know, they keep wanting to get to this. All right, so, <laughs> but, but so, all right. But, but let me just say one thing about the, the fox and the hedgehog. The way, the way it manifests itself in what we've been talking about is the hedgehog part of Sarge was somebody who could recognize operating in the world, the big picture of how compassion and service change things. And at the same time, not just stay there in those values, but recognize how to put them into, you know. Let, let me work. put it to you this way. We, we haven't stressed enough uh, Sarge's faith wasn't Christ a hedgehog and a fox? Wasn't Saint Paul a hedgehog and a fox? I'm not getting any response. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what do you think, Jamie? Um, Paul certainly was. No question about that. Jesus? It would be terrible to say no, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> I don't think he had a lot of uh, hedgehog, a lot of. Uh, Remember foxy what he to said do. to the apostles? Uh, probably. Which is, which is very much a theme of Peace Corps volunteers and how they were sent overseas to work. Take nothing with you. And that was a major text for Sarge in, in doing this. But that too is a whole other session and, a, and, a, and the kind of thing we'll also talk about in the winter and spring. Okay, Dylan, I'm pausing now for a second because I feel more comfortable about the time. What was your question? Um, well, mine was just a comment because I found this very helpful a couple of years ago when we started reaching out to government agencies to build opportunities. So the Peace Corps, the way it is currently set up, is a government agency just like the Department of Commerce, the Department of transportation, health and human services, housing and urban development, right? So this was very helpful. So there are cabinet level agencies, and those are many of the ones that I just named, U.S. Department of Commerce, Department of Transportation, uh, Housing and Urban Development. And then there's a U.S. Department of State, U.S. AID, and then the U.S. Peace Corps. So that is its own no, government no. agency. There's, there are elements of the history here that, uh, remember, was created by executive order. So executive orders can be modified. Executive orders can be repealed. And in fact, as you may know, Nixon, who hated the Peace Corps, changed the Peace Corps' executive order and stuck it into an agency called Action. And it withered in action. It went from 15,000 volunteers in 1967 to 4,000 when President Carter appointed Dick Celeste to be director of the Peace Corps. And Dick said, could you please come down to Washington and do an executive order that will get us out of action? Carter will sign it. And I did, and we did another executive order, and we took the Peace Corps out of action, and then Dick and I, with the extraordinary help of Senator from California, Alan Cranston, got the Senate to pass legislation that made the Peace Corps statutorily independent, no longer dependent on uh, the whim of the president at the time. That didn't happen until 1980, 1981. So the Peace Corps you're talking about in structure is very different from the Peace Corps that we're talking about today. 
Now, and to link your comment, or at least what I inferred from it, to yours, if it, it means something that acting in the world this way is acting on behalf of the U.S. government. So if it had been funded, if it were another philanthropic organization out there, like many, many are, it wouldn't have the impact that it does to say, this is, this is the way the U.S. government wants to work in the world. So it needed to be independent, but also governmental. At least I think so. Yes. Um, I guess, uh, going back to my question, I'm just I'm curious how in all of these kind of political wonderings and figuring out who, what container to put it in, how it was still keeping momentum, like how the program was still being developed, and like that's a really amazing thing to finagle and how that worked. It was amazing. And all this time, Bill was writing this legislation. Like, Starting in March, all the time Sarge was gone. So you can see, uh, I guess this comes out of Scott's book, that he thinks I finished the draft of the Peace Corps Act. It comes from Scott Stossel's biography. That's where I got I, that. He thinks I finished the draft of the Act on May 11, which, you know, is just a few days after the Dungan meeting. So I must have been working on it one way or the other. And Jamie and I had a very interesting conversation uh, in preparation of this. You want to talk about purposes? Yeah. I asked Bill, and I'll ask him again. I mean, the, the purpose of the Peace Corps um, is the, are the first couple of sentences of the Peace Corps Act. And I asked Bill when, he, when in the process he wrote this. Um, and I'll, I'll read it to you. So if you, you go to the bill, it's in your, in, your, um, in your, it's in the Dropbox. The Congress of the United States declares that it is the policy of the United States and the purpose of this act to promote world peace and friendship through, through a Peace Corps. We shall make available to interested countries and areas men and women of the United States qualified for service abroad and willing to serve under conditions of hardship if necessary. To help the people of such countries and areas in meeting their needs for trained manpower and to promote a better understanding of the American people on the part of the people served and a better understanding of other peoples on the part of the American people. But that first sentence, the Congress of the United States declares that it is the policy of the United States and the purpose of this act to promote world peace and friendship through a Peace Corps. And I asked Bill, when did you write that? Did well, I don't know when I wrote it. But uh, there obviously are strands in the President's special message on the Peace Corps which are relevant here. Here's the last paragraph. Most heartening of all, the initial reaction to the proposal has been an enthusiastic response by students, professional organizations, private citizens everywhere. A convincing demonstration that we have in this country an immense reservoir of dedicated men and women winning, willing to devote their energies and time and toil to the cause of world peace and human progress. So my strong guess is I took it from there. You know, it's always the lawyer's search for precedent. You know, we're never, we're never comfortable, you know, unless we can point to authority for something that we're about to do. Mm -hmm. And of course, earlier in the speech, earlier in the message, he talks about the needs for skilled manpower, skilled workers, overseas. So I must have taken those strands that Jamie just read out of the special message and welded them together. Yes. What direct benefits did the um, what direct benefits did the Peace Corps bring to the US because I understand that its a, its objective was to instill peace and com compassion around the world. But I feel like that wouldn't be really enough to just convince the Congress to um, appropriate money to this organization. 
Peace, former Peace Corps volunteers say almost unanimously that the Peace Corps was far more important to them in their own development than anything they did overseas. Now, they may not be right about that, but that's what they say, almost unanimously. And certainly it was part of President Kennedy's um, goal. And you'll see this in, in one of the documents that we have for the last session next Friday. You'll see that uh, Caroline Kennedy wrote a book called Listening In, which is a transcription of conversations that were taped by JFK. There's only one that deals with Shriver. And Shriver is calling up with a concern about CIA plant, I think I talked about this earlier, in, in a Thailand training program. But what does the president do? He immediately changes the subject. He changes the subject to, <coughs> when are we going to have 100,000 former volunteers? What provisions are we making for volunteers to serve in the foreign service, in the civil service. And in your papers you will see, I don't know whether the President was aware of this at the time he had this conversation, but you will see that within days the President signed yet another executive order authorizing four more Peace Corps volunteers to be appointed to the foreign service and the civil service if they had served <coughs> satisfactorily a full term of service without a competitive exam. So we were striving for that even then. And, you know, one can name, I mean, I don't know, uh, Christopher Hill, who was in charge of all of the negotiations with North Korea during uh, the last round of six, if you know about the round of six. Chris is a Cambodian volunteer, now the dean of the Foreign Service School at the University of Denver. I mean, I can give you hundreds of examples. And more um, closer, I don't know, to, and not not more not close not closer to that. But in response to your, in response to your question, next week we're going to be focusing on how does this work in the field and what kind of benefit is it. So there's that answer. But then in terms of the congressmen themselves, and we will we'll, we'll get on to this. Sergeant Bill Moyers went and talked to each one of them and told them about the program. And if they had any doubts, and some did because some voted, voted against it, he made sure that they understood what it was, what the program was, and responded to their doubts. He particularly went after the folks who were doubting. Went to see him three, four, or five times. So that's how Congress would, I mean, how he, how he took care of that problem that you pointed out. But, where are we? Um, Sarge comes back. All eight countries have said yes. Um, you know, there were cables, but it isn't the kind of, there, it isn't the, I, I'm guessing, you can, con you can confirm this, that he didn't know all the details of what was, what was going on. Um, well, the program on. officer went out to each country. R right. Did he know all the detail, all the political details of what was going on at home while he was on tour? I have no idea. Right. That's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. Um, so he comes back, starts a, a recruitment push, starts a PR push, and um, also... Creates a selection program, creates a training program, mm -hmm. involves universities and private agencies all over the United States, as, in fact, the towering task recommended. Right. That in order to broaden the impact of the Peace Corps in the United States domestically, that universities and private agencies like CARE and the Experiment for International Living be involved in the recruitment, training, and overseas administration of Peace Corps volunteers. Mm -hmm. And he also learns, here's from um, you, I guess, from, uh, from Bill Moyers, that you're on your own when he comes back, launches all those things, finds out that, um, that his brother-in-law has uh, said, get your own damn bill passed, in effect. And 
according to Scott Stossel's biography, and I, I, um, I don't know if you, if you were the you were the one who, who told him this when he was writing the book, but he went to uh, by way of his his wife Eunice, he um, he asked President Kennedy if that were so, and learned indeed that it was. But I'm not sure that that was necessarily spiteful, which is the way Scott interprets it. I think JFK, having made that decision, understood that we were better off to be on our own. Sarge, though, his response to that was, OK, then we got to do this. we got to ramp up. And so in the midst of everything else he was doing, he hits, hits the ground and decides and sets up, a, sets up an organization headed by Bill, Bill Moyers, parallel to um, Larry O'Brien's... No, no, unrelated. Unrelated, yep. <coughs> You've got to explain who Larry was. Larry was the um, public affairs representative for the White House. He, he took con um, congressional relations, and by parallel, I meant replicating. Nope. Okay, what, did, what happened with that? Well, it basically was a two-person show, Shriver and Williams. Not a lot of staff. And they went door to door. They went door to door. And they got Hubert Humphrey to introduce the legislation. Right. And there was no trouble in the House, as I explained. The, mm -hmm. the Foreign Affairs Committee people were just only too much to climb on board. Except for the chair of the... Uh, chair of the uh, no, no. In the not... I mean, the, the oh, Morgan, I, oh, 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 I meant the Senate. In the House. Doc Morgan was a strong supporter of the Pennsylvania Congress. Without letting you know, I shifted in my brain to the um, Senate. Anyway. Because, as I understand it, um, and, and we mentioned uh, Senator Fulbright before, who was chair of the Foreign, uh, foreign Affairs, that um, he didn't like the Peace Corps, he didn't like the bill, and he held it up in, um, in conference, or in his, in his committee. In the documents that you'll get for next week, you'll see that there is a Shriver memorandum complaining about the fact that here it is, it's August, we're heading toward adjournment. And Senator Mansfield, who was then the Democratic leader in the Senate, enlisting the priority bills, didn't list the Peace Corps bill. The, on your timeline, if you look in August, you see there's a, there's a real flurry of activity there. It's, what's, it's the part that Bill is referring to. Um, Sarge writes to the president seeking his support for Peace Corps legislation, lamenting the fact that it isn't listed as in the Mansfield, in the Mansfield uh, isn't listed as one of the priority pieces. Um, he, and of course, I'm sure in the back of his mind, he's got Peace Corps volunteers in the pipeline to go out. Um, the, uh, as a matter of fact, as you, you can see. You had volunteers at that point in training for what was then called Tanganyika, and training for Ghana, and training for Nigeria. So, you know, we created quite deliberately what you young people now call boots on the ground. Quite deliberately. You're going to stop it. This is, these are the consequences of stopping it. You will disappoint these countries. You will disappoint these wonderful young people. And uh, the risk was, you're doing all this stuff and we haven't even authorized you. Right. That goes back to your question, how are they funding the volunteers right. and the boots on the ground? There, there was a pot of money in the foreign aid program called the Contingency Fund, and we tapped it for $10 million, which financed the whole startup effort. And Congress eventually, after the Peace Corps, Act authorized 40 million, appropriated 30 million, and that was enough to carry us through the first year. So they retroactively fit in the 10 million to the to the overall budget. 
we were then budgeted in the regular budget process for <coughs> fiscal 62 at about 60 million. Okay. But Sar this is sort of Sarge's lobbyist, and I and I, I'm trying to imagine what what would happen there. He he writes to the president saying we need your support. Um, he cables. John Kenneth Galbraith, who's the ambassador to India at this time, saying, put pressure on um, Senator Fulbright. The New York Times comes out with an article the next day saying that Fulbright is saying, well, we ought to cut it back to 10 million from 40. Sarge writes Larry O'Brien in the, uh, in the uh, public affairs office, asking him, it, this is a document that's in your paper. It's, it's in your papers, and as I read it, asking him to urge all the members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to get the get the bill out of committee on the one hand, and two to go to the House markup of the bill the next day and and um, state their support. Um, I hope this is still relevant to the discussion. Uh, Louder. It seems like there is. Uh, a lot of domestic convincing that needs to be done, um, and but there's also an element of like international marketing. Um, is there any way you can talk about why that was successful in this process? Why well, the, uh, the countries where the Peace Corps volunteers initially went really wanted them, and so instead of having interminable negotiations of these international agreements, it. Uh, when I became a lawyer in the State Department, notwithstanding the fact that the United States has been providing aid to Korea since 1947, we had never successfully negotiated a bilateral aid agreement. That was the first thing I was assigned to do, finally get it done. And it took me almost two years to get it done. Whereas by the time Peace Corps volunteers arrived in Tanzania, then Tanganyika, you know, Ghana. The international provisions were all in place. Part of it was simplicity. We weren't asking for much. Do you, do you know what happened during that two or three day period with um, Senator Fulbright or that would go from recalcitrance to voting, the, to his committee voting 14 to nothing and, and, send, and sending it out? Back, back in those days, markup was held in closed sessions. And the executive branch people would sit outside the door in the corridor and occasionally you'd be invited in if some question arose that they wanted the executive branch's view on. <clears throat> what I remember about the markup in the Foreign Relations Committee is that Bill and I were sitting outside and the door opened and we were asked to come in. And he and I were sitting there and I no longer remember what Fulbright was so upset about, but he was just beating the shit out of us. To the point where I wrote on the, my pad in front of me, I wrote on, you know, <coughs> how much longer do you think this is going on, Bill? And he writes back, I have no idea, but one other thing I can't stand is how you can sit there and look so cool. <laughs> so I don't know the answer to that question. It's clear that for some reason or other, Senator Fulbright thought this had something to do that was negative, had negative implications for the Fulbright program. And that became clearer two years later, getting ahead of our story again. Two years later, Congress was uh, putting all kinds of restrictions uh, in appropriation bill riders on the foreign aid program, which continued to be exceedingly unpopular. And these restrictions were always phrased in terms of uh, agencies or programs for which appropriations were made. 
And that meant these restrictions applied to us. We didn't want them to apply to us. We actually had in the original Peace Corps Act uh, a waiver of the Battle Act, which prohibited uh, foreign aid to uh, Iron Curtain countries. And we wanted to go to Iron foreign country, Curtain countries. We actually got an invitation from Czechoslovakia that was later withdrawn. We would have honored that. Yeah. Um. I guess I don't really understand like the opposition because within the context of like the Cold War that um, Sarge was able to get India to get these countries to agree and to be enthusiastic uh, would be like really good for foreign relations for the U.S., right? And would it, like would it, I imagine that no matter what party you're on or what programs you're trying to support that this idea of uh, kind of winning, having like an up in the Cold War, which is... You think that <coughs> uh, Nehru and Suharto, the president of Indonesia, were popular in the United States Congress in 1961? Well, I imagine they want to beat Russia. <laughs> You know, the non-aligned bloc was very important. And this is a time, not actually dissimilar to the election we just had, where you were expected to take sides and not expected to be neutral or on the fence. Does that answer your question? The story I was about to tell, so I decided to draft a provision that would go into the Foreign Aid Act of all places, that would say that no rider in an appropriation bill under this statute would affect the Peace Corps. And Moyers and I lined up bipartisan support for that. We had two Republican senators from New York, Keating and Javits. We had a very conservative but highly respected Democratic senator from West Virginia, Jennings Randolph, uh, who was then chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee. So he wielded a lot of pork power. Uh, and then I got a call from one of the assistants to one of the senators saying, that the amendment had been tabled on the floor and Senator Morse, who was a little bit of a, of a maverick, a senator from Oregon, had asked for a live quorum. A live quorum in the Senate is a slow call. You know, the clerk says, Aiken, or he said that in those days because Aiken was, began with an A and he was a senator from Vermont. And there would be a long pause, and then he'd go on to give plenty of time for the senator who had called for the live quorum to find out what was going on and satisfy himself. So I got into a taxi, went up to the hill, walked into the Senate cloakroom, and what did I see? Off in a corner was Fulbright McGovern, who was then now a senator, Humphrey Morris, Javits and Keating and Randolph. And what was going on? Well, if you're going to accept the Peace Corps from all of this, Fulbright was saying, I want, I want the Fulbright program accepted from all these writers too. And McGovern was saying, and I want full, pre full for peace out from under. So, you know, I sat down, I scribbled away handed it around, everybody went yes, gave it to the clerk, the clerk typed it up, passed something like 65 to nothing. Larry O'Brien got wind of what we were doing and he called us, the White House has an incredible way uh, of finding you no matter where you are. Bill and I were having coffee in the coffee shop at the bottom of our Peace Corps building and uh, Payphone rang. It was Larry. What the hell are you guys doing on the hill? 
Larry, you said we were on our own, and we are. Great. So, <laughs> I guess after that, um, the piece, the act gets out of, I mean, Fulbright releases it. I still don't really understand him, but um, he was against, he was an internationalist, he was against Vietnam, he was against, okay. Well, that was later, that was much later. Um, I guess that's right. We're talking 61 now. The, um, so the Peace Corps Act He gets, never voted for a Civil Rights Act. Yeah, I do know that. He voted for the, the Southern <coughs> Convention or whatever it was called. Um, so the Peace Corps Say that a little louder. There was a... Don't mutter about that. I muttered because I wasn't sure the name of it. Um, the Southern Convention, is that what it was called? The Southern... There was a there was um, there was a resolution passed that was um, signed by many southern um, members of Congress who went on record saying they were against they were for segregation, and he was one of those segregation. It was an anti civil rights statement, and he um, he signed that. Road southern Scholar manifesto is that what it is? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, so on the 25th of August, the Peace Corps Act is approved by the Senate. Three days <coughs> later, President Kennedy gives an address and sends them off. The uh, volunteers depart for Ghana and Tanganyika. Roughly th three weeks later, the Peace Corps Act is approved by the House. And then JFK signs it on September 22nd. That must have been an amazing time for you. So here's the, the last story for this session. So, you know, <clears throat> signing a statute is, is a big event. And all kinds of senators and congressmen, those who are for it, those who are against it, uh, celebrities and so forth. And I don't remember who said this to me any longer, but Someone said to me, you know, you will be the only person in that room whom the president doesn't know. And he will pay particular attention to you. Don't be surprised. So, you know, the bill gets signed and everybody gets a pen and everybody's laudatory. And JFK comes over to me and says, come here, I want to show you something. He leads me over to the door to the Rose Garden and he points to the parquet floor. The parquet floor is full of little holes. And I look up, question on my face, and JFK looks at me and says, Ike's golf shoes. <laughs> <laughs> we did it, we made it. We did it, you, we did I didn't it. think we could. <laughs> but we'd, so we've, we made it to uh, September 22nd and Ike's Golf Shoes. Um, <laughs> thank you, Bill. And I wonder if anybody has any more questions for you. Please. If there's someone who would like to ask, ask that you know who took part in the process, would you like to ask them any particular questions like, like Senator Fulbright or ask, you know, Shriver, if what he thought, would you ask him any questions about the process? Anybody in particular? After it was all over? <coughs> you know how to answer that question. I don't know how to answer that. You mean question. if they, you mean if we could, if we could have a hologram of whoever we wanted right here, with <coughs> all the memories and and that, that they had, and we had a question to ask them. I mean, like I've always been wondering, <laughs> what were you? <laughs> What you have to do, this is kind of an answer to your question. <coughs> there are at least two categories of people in the world whom you never mislead. You can never mislead a journalist, ever. 
you can say, I don't want to talk about that. Yesterday, for example, there was a story in the New York Times about <coughs> the change in the uh, Avery Fisher Endowment of Philharmonic Hall. My wife, you may know, may not know, is the archivist historian of the New York Philharmonic for the last 30 years. So my phone, she didn't warn me about this, my phone starts to ring. All kinds of reporters who covered me when I was head of the Charities Bureau and who rely on me for comments on nonprofit issues are calling me, do you have a comment on this deal that Lincoln Center has made with the Fisher family? Of course, I declined comment. That's perfectly fair. You can also follow certain guidelines um, that were laid down a long time ago by a wonderful journalist about, I will give you technical assistance with respect to your, to your story. I don't want you to make a mistake, but I cannot be quoted or attributed. You can say, I'm telling you something that I know, but you do not know. So this is what we call background. And then there's a variation on that called deep background. And then there's something that originated actually with President Roosevelt. There's off the record. So there are categories that if you're going to deal with reporters, you need to master. Similarly, the other category are legislators. You can never, ever, play fast and loose with the legislator. Why are there these two categories? Because they have to write or act about many different things about which they will never know enough. They'll never know what you know. So they rely on you to play it straight with them. It was once an experience I had uh, into the Nixon administration, uh, Nixon had a Secretary of State, Bill Rogers, who and I had a complicated relationship with. But uh, there was a reception for Bill at the United Nations, and I decided to go. I got an invitation, decided to go, and I walked in, and there was a congressman who was on the Foreign Affairs Committee when we were putting the Peace Corps bill through, uh, named Wally, Pennsylvania also later went to jail. Uh, and, and he was hectoring Rogers about something as I walked up. And as I walked up, well, he pointed to me and said, now, Mr. Secretary, look, you know, Joseph's in here. You know, he always played it straight with us. He disagreed with us. He'd tell us what his disagreement was. But if we made a decision, he'd carry it out. I extricated myself from that situation. And Wally and I walked off together and he said to me, you know what John Stennis once said about Bill Rogers? I think we'll close on this one, right? Okay. He said, that Bill Rogers, he's as slick as a shithouse rat. <laughs> Maybe not on that. <laughs> Shall I close us with something else? I'll close us with something else. Thank you so much. This was fascinating. We love the interactive nature here. Can we give them a hand, please? We love doing it with you. Um, and next week, I'll have you know, is going to be even more exciting. We're going to have somebody here who was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Dominican Republic during a major challenge that the volunteers there faced. And Jamie and Bill will be here and Kirby Jones. And so we really hope that all of you will join us next week for the final workshop. And we'll send you out, of course, reminders and updates and things like that um, in the next week. And then I also wanted to turn it over to Steve, who's going to tell you a little bit more as he's my moderating the Tim Shriver event on Monday. So he's going to tell you a little bit more about that. Come on up. Thanks, Dylan. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to put in a special Sorry. plug for the event on Monday that you have um, a flyer of in front of you. Um, obviously, you know, a big part of this entire program is to learn about the legacy and impact of Sergeant Shriver. And that legacy lives on in multiple people and multiple programs, including his own children. And so 
Timothy Shriver, as many of you know, leads the Special Olympics and has written a new memoir called Fully Alive. And I'm about halfway through the book. And I've got to say, it is terrific. It's beautiful. It's moving. It's inspiring. Um, he's talking about his own personal journey, his family's journey, um, his own relatives, particularly his aunt Rosemary Kennedy and um, their struggles with intellectual disabilities. But what's interesting and I think relevant to this group, not just the Shriver connection, but also the way in which he's talking about, as he describes it, politics with a small p. So it's not politics as a means of exercising power or using government to affect change. It's really about politics as an act of service. And um, I've just been really struck by the book, and I wanted to make sure that you're aware of that. If you have time on Monday to come, it'll be here at 6 o'clock. I think all of you will very, very much enjoy it, especially given your connection to this program here. So with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. I love all the Shriver's children, but from the day he was born, Timothy was my favorite. <laughs> That's another reason to come. And <laughs> we'll also we'll have um, a conversation from two to three here in this room afterwards. If you want to ask us any questions, Bill and Jamie will stay. So that's something that's always available. We do understand if you have to head off and uh, go to class or, or other things. And I'll also answer questions about the fellowship and things like that. So thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.